During the first week, we figured out we were deemed essential because Silkscreen was a, a sign making business. Melissa and I decided to look for a venue that we could donate printing services to that were relative to the pandemic so that we can maintain in our heads, because nobody was checking, but we wanted to maintain in our heart and soul that we were essential. With the artist Eric Orr, we did over a thousand posters, five or six different images. We were donating them to an organization called Urban Pathways, which had 15 buildings in Manhattan that transitioned the homeless. They immediately said, no one is reading the CDC signs. So if you have something happy, upbeat, we'll take it. We figured you could print silk screens that were communication for wearing your mask, keeping a distance, and do it in an upbeat way. It wasn't like 10 little signs that they put on their doorway. They had them all over the hallways. Gary, it's great to see you over the wires here. We are excited to have Gary Lichtenstein Editions coming to Baltimore. Can you tell us about yourself and a little about the press? Sure. It's great to be having the opportunity to exhibit at Baltimore. Over the years, I watch different art fairs put together and oftentimes you look at opportunities and your fair looks like it's my kind of crowd, my group of people. Because I'm a fine art atelier, I'm a fine art press. I've been that since I started in 1977. I'm old school, fine art, limited edition prints, solely having to devote myself to silkscreen. So while I'm educated and understand lithography and etching and all the variety of printmaking techniques, silkscreen is what I do and where I've been for the expanse of my career. Then alongside working with some, you know, incredible artists and doing some very interesting projects that also span that amount of time coming to Baltimore is exciting because it allows me the possibility of, oh, what's in the drawer that I love and would love to see again. And then what are we doing now over the, the last couple of years or the last year or the last six months, or even as we speak today, while I'm akin to a lot of the, uh, and, and know some of my peers, you must know as well, it's, it's a unique crowd of there are publishers who are not printers and then there are printers who are not publishers. Well, we join both, you know, together. So we are publishing and we are the, the printers and the engineers of the projects, you know, that'll be on the wall. So. So the shop is at Mana in Jersey city right now, but how you weren't always there, obviously, because the building's fairly new. -ish. No, well, my career started in San Francisco, where I was for close to 35, almost 40 years under a different name, Soma Fine Art Press. But when I moved back East in 2000 is when I just was making a, a, sep a change in a separation and went under the name Gary Lichtenstein Editions. I was in a barn up in Connecticut in Ridgefield not far from the Aldrich Museum for 10 years. And if you were to ask me why I moved to Jersey City, I would want to do a double check. I The same question, why did you move from California? And I used to say, I don't know why I left San Francisco. I'm here now. We decided to move to Jersey City and into what is now Mono Contemporary. But at the time we moved, it was a shell of a building and it was a warehouse and yes, there was mana, but it was storage lockers being renovated. I love being close to the city. That was why I moved from the barn. And I also like to be in a place where we could have, I call it glass doors on, on the front of the studio so that people could come in and see and watch what we were doing while we were making prints whether it was formal or informal, it's been always giving us an opportunity either one-on-one -on -one or with a class or with a group of kids or with 
the museum to show and be able to explain what it takes to make limited edition prints. That's part of our DNA here and part of our maintaining an interest in bringing it to the communities at large. I've only been to Mana Contemporary twice. I think people would be so amazed at the facility and the various entities that are in there. It's insane. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and while all of that exists surrounding us, you're speaking to someone who was very happy in a barn where I knew who was coming by. The interruptions were my own. But it's funny because the thing that I love about the building the most is the loading dock, the high ceilings, and the industrial space to set up a fine art press. All the other things that continue to go on and develop, it's been an interesting place to be in an art building, an art cultural building. Are, are there any other presses in there, are there? There are, weren't any other businesses in here. It was four artist studios. So we are probably one of the only businesses rel relative to art because it's not a place where there would be galleries. What makes the building itself such a pleasure to walk into every day is that the foundations that were storing artwork in the facility before, it, it's also a fine art storage company, Mana, have utilized some of the, the spaces to more or less permanently exhibit some of the collections. So you have some incredible collections, pieces of which are on exhibit. And then there are galleries that are set up for longer term shows. And that's a really wonderful aspect of Mana Contemporary so that they create revolving shows, but they're not necessarily for sale shows. While every artist would tell you everything in this building is for sale because <laughs> it's a place where people are making art. <laughs> It has both edge. It, it looks like a cultural center. It would have been nice if it had a little more momentum when it came to sales and marketing, but such is the reason we go to art fairs. That's, that's right. One time we were in Mana, we were visiting with the um, estate of William Dutterer, and on our way out, we ran into Amy Sherald, the painter who is from Baltimore, and my partner Brian and I, who uh, we were both like, oh, well, hello, Amy. <laughs> and she took us into her new studio and there are people painting little blades of grass and stuff. I mean, it was nuts. I was like, hello. Right. What a nuts old place. It was great. Well, and again, it's a welcoming environment. And if you want to close your door, you close your door, you know. But again, I think the thread of it is people have an, you know, an opportunity to cherish the experience of either seeing the inside of an artist studio or in our case, coming in and seeing how prints are made or all of the above. Right. Who doesn't love walking into a shop? My question to everybody so far has one of them has been if an artist is interested in working with you either as a contract printer or as a publisher, how, how are you by invitation only? How do you, how do artists go about getting in with Gary Lichtenstein? They send us an email and give us a call. And we get on the phone and talk and see what, what it is that they're thinking about. And then, like you said, can be contract printing and, or it, our decisions on what to publish fall in a different, you know, category, because obviously there's a different obligation to the marketing and to the financial end. But on the other hand, we do both where we co-publish or we co-venture and for that, we're very unique. I know there are others like us as a business profile, but because I, my whole career has been based on both where I do love contract printing, obviously it's another form of earning a living, but you meet artists in relationships that you'd never meet if you were solely a publisher for 40 years, I have that also in my DNA and I could bump into someone who's an artist and look at something they're doing and saying, God, we should get together. Or someone could search us out or say, I heard of you through someone else. 
And over the span of my career, I've done the well-known, the not well-known, the famous, the not famous, but that is not a prerequisite. And oftentimes the inquiries are as valuable in developing certain relationships. So we choose along the way and then how much time we actually have in, in a month or in a year and what we can accomplish. We have several full-time employees and I have apprentices and I've also had interns. We usually uh, try to keep the studio busy. How, how did you fare through the pandemic? Our pandemic stories were interesting. Like everyone else, it wasn't a good economic time for us, but we did develop some of the marketing for the work online. And everyone will say online purchasing of prints grew because of the pandemic. But our story of the pandemic was during the first week, we figured out we were deemed essential because Silkscreen was a, a sign making business. So because we lived in Manhattan and had our car and we didn't really want to isolate in the apartment, which is not very big, M Melissa and I decided to look for a venue that we could donate printing services to that were relative to the pandemic so that we can maintain in our heads because nobody was checking. But we wanted to maintain in our heart and soul that we were essential. So we took on with the artist, Eric Orr. Gary, with the overwhelming the, demand right. for health and safety signage. Right. So it was the overwhelming demand for health and safety signage. Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, look at that. <laughs> and these were all coming out of the studio during the first three weeks or three months of the pandemic. We were then donating them to an organization called Urban Pathways, which had 15 buildings in Manhattan that transitioned the homeless. And they were very aware of what we offered because they immediately said, no one is reading the CDC signs. So if you have something happy, upbeat, we'll take it. We'll put it all over our, our walls. <laughs> so we did over a thousand posters that we wow. distributed. I mean, in volume, we did five or six different images. So we didn't stop printing them for about five months into the pandemic when we thought it was over. And then we realized it wasn't. So it's been a thread inside of our studio ever since. But U.S. News did an article about not only what we were doing, but what some boutique printers were doing in South Dakota and in San Francisco and in New Orleans, where there were more than us who figured out that you could print silk screens that were communication you know, for wearing your mask, keeping a distance and do it in an upbeat way and benefit a lot of people. And the beauty of it all was that it really did work because the, we did so much volume for this organization. It wasn't like 10 little signs that they put on their doorway. They had them all over the hallways and we then uh, printed a, a special editions that went into the rooms of where everyone's staying. We never looked back and we never thought twice and carried that with us. And then like all those that were involved in printing, it took us a while to rebuild our, our economy after the pandemic. It wasn't an easy time. I haven't talked to anybody who made use of their shop in a way that was helping the sort of, you know, the CDC. That That's amazing. Well, we weren't really helping the CDC. We were helping people because the CDC wasn't getting it right. They were too, the directions were hard to read. Let's put it that way. 
But yeah, it's a great story. We probably will have some of this with us in Baltimore because it's a great story and it's not an expensive high ticket item per se, but it's signed by Eric and we realized later on, okay, so we gave most of it away. That's good. Then someone would say, well, how much are those? And we say, oh, well, that's a good thought. I'll look forward to seeing them. That's a great idea. I love it. <laughs> Do you, can you, what else are you excited about bringing down to Baltimore? We're working with Say Adams. And so we're, we're excited about bringing the prints that we've published and some newer pieces. Al Diaz is another artist that we're very excited about working with. Wesa Deverney, who we work with the Aldridge Museum. We did a beautiful piece of hers. We, we're going to bring some of the pieces we've worked on with Jane Dixon. Right now, actually, her pieces went into the Whitney Biennial. So it's nice to be letting people know our relationship with her. We just did a couple pieces with Al Diaz and Dave Navarro. So that's a collaboration between two artists that we might very well bring that story. One of the things why it's taking a little longer to figure out, you know, who we're exhibiting because space is limited and you're trying to balance the economics and the, the wall space. But we love the storytelling like most printmakers do. So then you think, well, what do I want to talk about? Right, <laughs> And we have some great stories. So we did a piece we're going to bring with Eric or he, of course, cause we did all of the uh, pandemic, you know, but we did a piece with Eric or that he specifically collaborated on the drawing him and Keith Herring. And we had gotten the, the Herring's foundation's blessing because it it wasn't something we were going to them and saying, we want a license to Keith Herring. This was a drawings done in the subway by Keith and Eric, because they were friends. It's a historic piece. Bob Gruen, who you've seen, you can't help it because they're great stories and it, he's, it's a great relationship. So let me ask you this, when you are the publisher of a work, not contract, but a publisher, do you ever find yourself inserting your own sensibility into nudging an artist this way or that way, or saying, you know, Hey, it's gotta be more than puppies and sailboats. I won't change the through line of an artist's work, but like, for instance, working with Al Diaz and a lot of it is words. And I said, well, can we make it look like it's on a brick wall instead of floating on a white piece of paper? So we went out in the hallway and I took a picture of a brick wall and we made the brick wall, the background of the print. Uh, yeah. I like that one <laughs> with some artists. Yes. On a more sophisticated level, because we really want to make them look like prints. We're not trying to make reproductions of paintings. The level of experimentation is much higher. Then it might come down to, well, do you like the blue one or the red one or the green one, or the gold one? But again, then I did a piece with Al Diaz, a large scale piece that was printed on a very odd fabric that was then glued down to a panel board and then silk screened on top. And neither of us knew what we were doing until it was done. And it came out beautiful. It was one of those, can we try these materials? And there's a lot of that too, as well. You're reminding me, I was interviewing the three master printers out at Tandem Press in Madison during the SGCI conference. And they all reported these hilarious stories where an artist would say, can we do this? And they would all immediately say yes. And then look at each other and go, how in the hell are we going to do that? Yeah. And why did we say yes? The other side of that too is, oh, why did I suggest we do this? You know, <laughs> and you're thinking the artist was perfectly happy with the way it was. And I just gave myself three or four more days and how, <laughs> yeah, no. And that's, that's part of the shared dialogue that a show like yours offers because those stories do intertwine between whether it's tandem or 
ourselves or whether it's even individual, you know, publishers who might not be doing the printing where I think it's Jim Kempner, where I can't help but enjoy talking to Jim because he's funny and he, he makes, he makes fun. He makes it sound like fun, even though he knows it was a nightmare. And then he'll make movies about it, you know. Right, you know, exactly. You know, his thing. You know, I had a conversation with him about Robert Indiana one day because I, I was in his gallery and I was doing my Robert Indiana in person, my, my dialogue. And he goes, oh, I got a good story for you. And so, so it's absolutely true. Yeah, Jim is a delight and hilarious also, yeah. For me, that's the fun part about the fair is – a lot of them have been to the former fair that I ran at the Baltimore Museum of Art, which this one is not related to. So it just feels like old home week, you know? It's just yeah, and I'm sorry we missed coming to those fairs. Look, we're known for what we do, but we're not out there aggressively marketing the, the name as much. But, you know, now it was my happenstance of seeing someone else exhibiting at the Baltimore Print Fair that that prompted us to say, well, wait a minute, that, that looks like, a, because the word print fair is what I was so thrilled to see instead of just art fair. The thing that's always set the, the Baltimore Museum of Arts Fair apart from a lot of the other museum fairs in any, in any case was that it was all contemporary and that the works were on the walls instead of being pipe and drape in the middle of the courtyard or whatever. Right. When I took over the fair in 2012, we shifted away from secondary market dealers and galleries to you guys, the people who make the thing, so that when I'm standing at your table, I can talk to you who have made the thing with the artist, you know, right. which has, right. has carried on through into this one too. So Right. Oh, it's exciting. And, you know, I could tell you how much of a difference that makes, whereas a lot of people might not know that walking into a fair, that that difference is part of the ingredients. Yeah. And the other thing that you should know and might like to know is that the the museum has been educating the print interested people in Baltimore for over 50 years. <laughs> and there's a very well educated group of people that you will run into at this fair and you will not have to stand there and explain why it's original or not, or, you know, none of that. <laughs> right. 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 No, I, I'm thrilled about that. Yeah, most of you guys are. <laughs> Saves a lot of time. You get to I, cut to the chase, get to the next exactly. story. Exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we are very excited about seeing you, you in Baltimore and exhibiting at the Baltimore F Fair. We'll, we, we'll get our list of everything that we're exhibiting and then some. We've got some surprises of our own that we might not have thought of until we thought of what this fair represents, which is an appreciation and a love of printmaking and projects that, you know, might fall out of the box, not in the box. So, or as I like to call them, the things that are under the table. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So I usually say we're, people who collect have no wall space for it. And I said, then just put it under the bed with the other <laughs> ones that you have. And they said, how do you know that? And I said, because that's where they go. <laughs> Can't not, can't not buy it if you love it, or you can't not have it if you love it. Right, you right. Need to rotate your walls and use under the bed storage. <laughs> well, thank you for taking time out of your day to talk to us about the fair. Yeah, we're we're really excited, and um, yeah, can't wait. And and also, you know, we're trying to do our best in learning more about Baltimore too, because we haven't spent a whole lot of time, and so. We're first time exhibitors, so any tips or anything you have, let us know. But we're very excited. We're very excited.